Oh, it's great to have you with us. You're listening to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. My name's Simon Smart. And I'm Justine Toe. In the year 2000, governments around the world pledged together to halve extreme poverty by 2015. The Millennium Development Goals, many of you are aware of those things, they laid out this bold vision for the ways in which the developing world could assist some of the poorest countries to rise above extreme poverty and to find ways to foster better environments for the most vulnerable people and communities on the planet. Well, the Reverend Dr. Joel Edwards uh, was, up until very recently, the International Director of MICA Challenge, which was a coalition of Christian organisations that aimed to hold governments to account for the pledges they made at the turn of the century. Joel, these days, is at Durham University in the doctoral program, looking at, among other things, human rights. We might ask him about that in a moment. He's, uh, he's in Australia with Tear Australia. He's a regular broadcaster with BBC and other channels, often asked to give a Christian perspective on contemporary issues, which makes him a perfect guest uh, for us at CPX. Welcome, Joel. Thank you very much. It's good to be back. Now, you were with Micah Challenge from the beginning up to you know, up to this year, 2015. Uh, as you look back on this 15-year period, broadly, what do you see? Has this attempt to halve poverty gone well? What's happened? We think it's gone very well. And um, the last gig we had, if you like, was going back to Manhattan, uh, New York, where we started the journey as Micah Challenge to basically wind things up. And we had a, a kind of a signature event, which we call Celebration and Sorrow. And the idea was really to look at those things which have gone relatively well, those things we haven't quite hit, but yet to recommission ourselves for, you know, the post-2015 agenda. So some things have gone very well. Um, we have doing much better at uh, educating children, so full-time primary education, something like 90% of kids around the world now have that. Uh, The amount of children dying before the age of five has been reduced substantially. So we now talk about something like 25 um, thousand children dying each day, still horrendously too many. 58 million kids still without education, horrendously too many. Uh, um, women dying in childbirth gone down a little. But we've missed it massively on lots of things. The environment is one huge example. There's issues around good governance and, and corruption is still a big thing to be conquered. So it's good news and it's bad news. But what's really, really changed over the last 15 years is that there is now a global vocabulary to talking about poverty and some agreed indicators right across different cultures and political systems about what it means to work together for a better world and a world free from extreme poverty. Was it hard to keep the momentum going when you look back over those years? There were lots of things that occurred in that time that might have made things complicated, uh, I imagine. There was the global financial crisis, there's a whole lot of stuff around terrorism. There's lots going on in that period. Yeah, definitely. I think the biggest monster to conquer was cynicism. And, you know, that didn't dissipate in the first five years, but certainly I think we got over the hump of terminal (laughs) cynicism in the first five years. And then, as you say, after that, your MDG1, we were doing really well in the resting extreme hunger, went back as we had food crisis uh, with famines and droughts and environmental issues. And then with the 208 slump, uh, some of that ground was lost as well. But the great news is that despite those losses, the momentum, the impetus, the commitment, even the champions, when you get people like the Gates and the Bonos behind the agenda, um, it means that the commitment and the political commitment is still intact as we go to the post-2015 agenda. Can you give us a sense of how you overcome that cynicism, especially when it comes to dealing with so many different international players? Um, You know, everyone has their own agenda. People want to compromise in certain areas and not in others. So how, I know it's a very simplistic question in some ways, but how do you try and get that cooperation happening? Yeah, it's a simplistic question, but it's a very, very critical question, actually, because I think the best antidote for cynicism is, does it work, mate? And when you actually look at the fact that, uh, you know, during this period over the last 20, 25 years, we have actually reduced extreme poverty by 50 percent. And that's massive. So we used to talk about 52 percent of the world's population living in extreme poverty. And now we're saying that's uh, kind of 25 ish percent or 30 percent around about there. That's a huge difference. And when you look at those hard facts, it encourages you to deal with cynicism 
cynicism and overcome cynicism in order to keep the battle going. So when people, I mean, before people would have said, you know, trying to get rid of extreme poverty, it's just a pie in the sky dream. But you're like, no, actually, it is achievable and in our lifetimes and we can get it done. Well, it is achievable. And, you know, once again, when you get um, people of significance and not just politicians, but your uh, kind of champions in the music industry, your champions in the world of business, when you get people like those saying this can be done. It does actually empower most of us to keep thinking that really this can be done. Uh, And then when you see the results up close, when you see that millions of kids, millions of individuals have been rescued from malaria, HIV and AIDS, uh, when you see these practical outcomes, you know that if we can sustain the will and the commitment, it can be done. Now, Joel, the causes of poverty are so complex. There's so many different things that produce the situations that we've seen. What are the biggest obstacles in getting people to commit to this dream? It's tackling cynicism. That's an ongoing battle. Um, It's making sure that the political will is there um, to get the balance right between the complicated issues of security national interest over against global identity and global interest. It's trying to get the balance right between um, legitimate concerns about terrorism and poverty and how those two things work together. It's recognizing that there is a a very definite correlation between education and terror. The more you educate, the more likely it is that we can bring terrorism down in certain countries. So it's trying to mix these political, security, financial, domestic um, realities in order not to lose sight of the 1.25 billion people who still live in extreme poverty. Joel, you mentioned earlier that climate change was where um, the Millennium Development Goals haven't kind of been going as well as you'd hoped they would. And just now when you've been talking about you know, understanding the kind of intersectionality, I suppose, of all these different issues. Climate change is something that has huge impacts on the global poor as well. Where do you see the campaign for climate change going in the next little while, especially as you've identified that this is an area that needs more addressing? Yeah, there are better people you could talk to about that for a more precise response. But I think the the real challenge still remains in the the major industrial nations who are still responsible for the the vast majority of the output of damaging chemicals and so on, uh, um, to actually make their commitment real and to actually follow up on commitments. So it's been really encouraging, for example, to hear President Obama uh, challenging uh, America to rise up to its responsibility, and with particular reference to the emissions from power plants, which is responsible, as he reminded us, uh, for more damage to the environment uh, than the motor industry from other forms of industries combined. Uh, and without any kind of regulations against them. Now, if America can make that kind of move, I think it's going to make a big difference. Also, we see nations like China also stepping up its efforts. So if we can see this kind of momentum increasing, I think there's hope to try to get it right in the near future. I can't help but think about how Australia is kind of (laughs) a little bit of an anomaly amongst the nations that you've just mentioned um, in terms of its climate change policy. But Australia has also made quite substantial cuts to foreign aid over the last um, couple of years. What do you have to say about that? I think it's bad news. And I think Australia's response to climate change, you know, kind of going backwards, Australia's reneging on its commitment to 0.7 in aid is is, I think, a prime example of a nation which is is wrestling with the tensions between issues of national security and identity and being a part of a global player, uh, part of a global village. And it seems to me that, uh, you know, when I travel, as I do in a limited way across Australia, um, I just cannot buy the idea that Australia is likely to be overcrowded Uh, in the near future by a few thousand people who are basically escaping for their lives. I think it's it's inhuman. Um, And I think what 
Australia is failing in is the kind of leadership which has a real sense of its global responsibility over against protecting its boundaries from the other. Um, and I think as long as that be- remains a part of Australia's political culture, um, the kind of recession in its commitment or the receding of its commitment is probably likely to continue, which is really bad news for the rest of the world. If you've just joined us on Life and Faith, we're talking with the Reverend Dr. Joel Edwards, who uh, has been the director of Micah Challenge International. Uh, we're talking about the Millennium Development Goals and other efforts to halve extreme poverty. Now, looking at this work that you've been involved with uh, over several years, can you give us an example of some uh, something that worked really well, that made a huge difference to people on the ground and it really affected you? I think there are two things we did well. This is speaking as a global campaign. Uh, one was in 2010, we were on the 10th of October 2010. We managed to galvanise about 60 million people around the world. It was a Sunday and uh, these were mainly uh, pre- folks from the Christian tradition. So about 60 million people in churches to think about poverty, to pray about poverty, and many, many thousands to actually make a practical commitment as to what they would do. And then you began to see some great stories of how that impacted people in education, in community outreaches, and so on. But the thing which I am most proud about, I think, was the global campaign uh, against corruption which we had, broadly speaking, a trillion dollars US going missing through various forms of dishonesty. Uh, But to have a three-year campaign finally end up right here in Australia, right here in Brisbane as we join hands with the Shine the Light campaign, which Michael Challenge Australia did last year, was phenomenal. For Christians to take up the challenge on behalf of everybody else to say, look, $160 billion going missing through multilateral dishonesty just isn't good enough. And we have to hold our multinationals into uh, to account. And to be a part of a campaign which not only did a brilliant job in terms of its press coverage, in terms of its strong message, but also in terms of intelligent asks, which were actually carried through by the G20 nations, which were the object of our campaign, was a great way to finish a global campaign uh, last year. Can you speak, Joel, about your Christian faith and how it energises... Um, what is, you know, when you're spearheading a very big campaign, very ambitious campaign, where does that energy come from? Okay, so we've got two hours for this program, right? <laughs> That's good. Uh, yeah, I think the, the one thing which informs my work because of my faith is the sense of hope. Uh, God is a God of hope, you know, I... We serve a Christ who is a Christ of hope. That's what Christians believe fundamentally. It goes to the very core of who we are as Christians. And therefore, as we engage in the world, the the world beyond the church, and we're involved in business, as we're involved in politics, as we're involved in community work, as we're involved in advocacy, not just for people who believe what we believe, but for a better world. The reality of hope informs you in the face of impossibilities. And I think without this idea that God exists in tomorrow, then it becomes very hard to do some of the things we need to do today. That was very succinct. It didn't take two hours, but I'm sure you go into much more detail. <laughs> <laughs> we could. We could. Well, Joel, your whole life has uh, brought this combination of faith with activism on behalf of other people in various forms. No doubt it will continue after the Micah Challenge challenge. And I uh, wish you well. So good to have you in to talk about it. Thanks. That's been a pleasure. Next time on Life and Faith, we go behind the Iron Curtain to find out what it was like growing up as a Christian in the former Soviet Union. When I was 10 years old, I I had to make a decision. Do do I become a so-called pioneer, uh, which is, you know, the young youth uh, Communist League member or or, or not? So for for me, that was the first time I had to decide, uh, do I tell people publicly, my friends, my teachers, that I'm a Christian or, or, or not? So... Uh, and of course, when all of your friends are wearing those red ties, uh, it, is, it is a difficult choice for, for anybody to make. That's next time on Life and Faith. See you then. Mm-hmm.